the podcast that floats down here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melissa, your Stephen King veteran. Hi, I'm Ben, the Stephen King and horror film fanboy. And hello, I'm Luke, your first time Stephen King reader. Hi, and welcome. It's the podcast that floats down here. I am Melissa, and we are here discussing the book Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. This book was published on November 14th, 1983. It is 373 pages long, although my copy is 562, so I don't know where I got that number from. This is almost 600 pages in my hand. The dedication for this book was for Kirby McCauley. I am joined by a wonderful panel of readers. We're gonna start with Ben. Hi, Ben, how are you? Good evening. I'm well here. Also with me is, as always, Luke, otherwise I would be able to click the buttons. Hi there. Nice to be back. This is a fun book. Oh, okay, that's an interesting take. Okay. <laughs> and tonight our special guest for the evening is Dog. Hello, welcome to our show. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Thanks for having me, guys. And uh, yeah, great to be back here again. I was a uh, guest, uh, I don't know, maybe about a year ago or so uh, uh, for a Game of Thrones chat. But yeah, really looking forward to uh, talking about uh, Pet Cemetery with you folks. One of my favorite Stephen King uh, novels. Actually, one of my favorite novels of all time. Who am I uh, kidding here? So, um, but yeah, great to be here. Uh, really looking forward to talking with you guys about the, uh, uh, the novel. So thanks for awesome. having me. Um, we are typically joined for our Stephen King book club with from Abby Gertie from House Condescension. She is, however, in the process of moving cross country and is not available because she's living out of a truck. So hopefully she'll be back next month, possibly even live in state at least. We'll see. But in the meanwhile, she says hello and she's not talking to all of you. Okay, because she can't. This book, the back cover says, sometimes dead is better. When the Creeds moved into a beautiful old house in rural Maine, it all seemed too good to be true. Physician father, beautiful wife, charming little daughter, adorable infant son, and now an idyllic home. As a family, they've got it all, right down to the friendly cat. But the nearby woods hide a blood-chilling truth, more terrifying than death itself, and hideously more powerful, Pet Cemetery. Whew. All right. We're going to start us off. So the next, this part, we start off just sort of three big thoughts. You each get up to three, less than three if you want. What are your big takeaways? What stood out to you? What's your thought? Open it up. Go for it, Bench. So, okay, yeah. So I, I might kind of start right from the beginning. Uh, as different from other King books as we've covered so far, there's no terrible parenting in this story. Like... There's some bad choices because, like, PTSD on Rachel's part, you know, because of her history and everything. There's some bad choices on Rachel's father's part. But in general, not bad parenting at all, which was interesting to see from a Stephen King novel, you know. <laughs> Just to, to this point, at least, it was interesting uh, because, you know, it's one of those, like, and there wasn't a character that I... Because typically there's one character where I'm like, oh, just fuck that guy. You know, there really wasn't in this book. Like, there's a couple that annoyed you. They kind of like, yeah, I want to see that guy punched in the mouth once. But it's not like, you know, they're the worst people ever. And so it's it, it's nice to go into the full-on supernatural realm, you know. And it's not it, – it's a humanic story, but, like, the, the crux of it is not human-based, if that makes sense. You know, there is a mis an actual mystical – thing being done which again is a bit different than what we've seen i will say i liked that part i liked that there was parenting and co-parenting and healthy adult relationships just me yeah i i thought it was maybe the most realistic to everyone's like normal uh, i guess 
normal is not a really good term to use, but more average uh, lifestyles, right? This is, there's nothing supremely different about this family, right? They're just going out there. There's, yeah, mistakes are made, but they're just straightforward by the book people for the most part. They have disagreements, they work through them. And, you know, there's still tension between them in certain relationships, but, you know, that's just how life goes sometimes. And you have to work through that together. And, oh, I disagree with your idea on this form of parenting or this idea that we have to work through. Or, you know, but we still have to do this as a, as a unit. I think it's a, a pretty different story, definitely, like Benji said, from what we've seen in, in what this is, the sixth King book that, that our group here has talked about. Very different. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, great points everybody made there. And uh, yeah, I just just like to say, yeah, this family's they're likable characters, right? Uh, I'm I'm thinking of an example of uh, where I think it's right when we first pull in, uh, Gage gets stung by the bee, but yeah, uh, Ellie was you know she's she uh, falls off the swing kind of thing, right? But you know in the background, you know in Lewis's mind, you can he's like oh my gosh, she's screaming like it's just, you know, the end of the world. And who hasn't seen like a, you know, a little, little kid or toddler or something like that, uh, you know, kind of, you know, wanting, you know, that kind of attention like that. It was just kind of like an everyday thing that really drew you into these characters. And uh, that's why it's just so, you know, I guess, I guess we'll get into that when, uh, when I share my thoughts there too. But I think just overall, uh, these are likable characters, just your, uh, they're, they're not the, you know, they're not the cleavers by any means, but they're just likable characters. I wonder if that's, for me, my biggest takeaway, honestly, in this book is that it's really hard. It was hard to force myself to the end of the book. It has been decades since I've read this book. It's not one of my go-tos when I just want to pick up a book and read, because I remember being so, like, it just didn't sit well with me. And I couldn't remember why. I, I, I knew bad things happened, but I couldn't remember what it was. And as I was plugging along, you know, I was half reading it and half listening to it and switching back and forth. And at one point I was like, I have to stop listening to the audiobook because I need to be in control of when I can like stop and pause and find out what's going. And I think it's because the characters are so relatable. They have faults, they have fears, they're, they're just normal humans. It makes them easier to relate to. That could be me. That could be me and my husband and our kids. That could be our road right outside my house, you know? And yes, the supernatural element, like that makes it a little less likely, but all the rest of it, yeah. that could just happen. So it's, it's really disturbing to me when you like start thinking that could be my life. And so that makes it harder because I don't want it to be my life. And so I don't really want to know how it ends because I know Stephen King. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I'll kind of jump to something really quick. My first introduction to this was the movie. This was actually my second Stephen King movie I ever saw. I was probably nine years old. Watching I don't think this. this one was my fault. No, this was not your fault. This was uh, a friend down the street uh, from where we grew up, him and his older sister. Uh, but this was one we would watch over and over again. And so the differences, uh, and I know we're not movie discussion, but the differences we'll talk about later. Uh, it's one thing that throws me when I go back and read this, because this is uh, probably, this was the second Stephen King book that I ever read. And so the differences aren't drastic, but there's slight changes and it's like, oh shit. And so now when I'm reading, there's stuff that I can't remember. Is that book or is that movie? And it really just screws with me <laughs> a lot of times so on the way through right yeah for the adaption they really uh especially a lot of the conversations it might be like where ellie's talking to lewis and uh you know they're talking about death and dying and it might have been over like missy's death in the film or something like that or you know but it was really over Nor norma's death in the book but uh just real uh if, if i could um yeah my i, I you know i had uh, we wrote down our thoughts and stuff and like my biggest thought, you know, coming out of this was, and Melissa was, you know, bringing that, bringing that, bringing that to our attention anyway, was grief, right? Because it was just like out of all these characters that you just love and uh, are, are very likable and you're kind of drawn into uh, the grief that you're going to go through, you know, by the end of this book is just, uh, and the grief that our characters go through too. But I think the main theme of the, of the book overall is grief, uh, what grief will do to folks um it'll you know mess with their sanity even 
uh, you know, things of that nature, you know, it's, it just totally kind of takes away your free will, um, even to the point of, you know, where, you know, we lose the cat. And uh, I remember w when you're reading about that, where uh, Lewis is going through, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not church, maybe it is, you know, you know, it's, you know, it, he's only like 90% sure that, you know, maybe it's not that cat, you know, but when he finally sees, you know, the cat and he's like, he realized that he loved church. Right. And then kind of like as a reader, you're just kind of like, oh, man, you know, and uh, but you know that that's just going to go through uh, more and more and more, especially what we see with Judd um, going through it at first, too. I wept a couple of times through this book. So I completely agree that, you know, the the main theme is, you know, kind of along the lines of grief and pain and death and even denial of that. You know, it's the lack of believability in some of these big real life things, right? And one of the, the big first argument that we have between Lewis and his wife are about Ellie being told about death, right? And that, hey, you, eventually your cat's going to die. And she starts freaking out and like a kid does. You know, if it's your first experience with something like that, it can be difficult to handle. And so, and I don't know what Melissa's questions are, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a question similar to, hey, what are your guys' thoughts on telling children about those things? I, I tend to fall under more of Lewis's style of honesty is always the best policy. You don't need to sugarcoat it, you know, you, or you don't need to give them a bloodbath description, but I think being realistic about that sets the tone for making it a healthier uh, relationship with death moving forward because it's inevitable. It's going to happen to people around you. It's going to happen to people you know, people you don't know. It's going to happen to you someday. So I think it's healthy to get that at least in a small child's head to start grappling with at some point. Two points. Number one, Melissa does not have a question about that, so thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I do have questions, though, so I won't steal that one. Two, I, I tend to have a similar parenting style. I'm an oversharing parent. I'd rather tell you too much because I want you to hear it from me to the point where you cannot possibly want to ask anybody else about it. So I, I, I will tell you. I will tell you what I know. I can tell you what I believe. I can tell you what other people believe. I can tell you, like, yes, that's going to happen. My son, when he gets really mad, he's like, well, fine but you're just going to die anyway. And I'm always like, yeah, I, I am eventually. He's like, no, you're not supposed to die. Like, which throws him off, which is funny, but hopefully not soon. But yeah, like I'd rather just be upfront. Matter of fact, developmentally appropriate, but no. knowing is better than not knowing and creating your own imaginative answer. I mean, I, I personally, I think the earlier, the better, you know, it just it eases them into it. Like, I, I was lucky enough when I was like three or four, uh, we lost our dog Daffy. I got introduced to death very quickly because I loved that damn dog. Got introduced real early on, knew what it was. It sucked, but, you know, so that's kind of, you know, my feeling is about that time is where you kind of start introducing it. Like right now with my son, he's been watching dinosaurs eat people on uh, Jurassic Park uh, Evolution or, uh, Evolution World. It's like, they're dead. Oh, they died. <laughs> it's kind of funny. You know, so he gets it to a point. All right. Anybody want to jump to another thought? Anybody have one that's kind of burning to get out to the group? Uh, I guess kind of right along with that, you know, we have some very prominent characters that, that die. And they're not necessarily big characters that we know of, but they become big in how they uh, interact with the story and everything moving forward. The biggest one... It's the day that starts the whole nightmare in Lewis's opinion is when uh, Vince, Vince, Victor, Victor Pascal, um, the jogger, gets essentially cut in half by a truck, right? And his head's cracked open and he is brutally, brutally dying. And this is this is Lewis's first day <laughs> at the office or like the first day with kids back at school yeah. or something. And like, wow, that's even for a doctor, you know, who's been doing his thing for a long time, that affected him, right? And there's that helplessness that he knew no matter where this kid was brought to. He could have been brought to the best surgeon in the world. You're not saving him. And the fact that you still have to kind of do your best and so that you can look in that, you know, kid's parent's face and say, I tried. It was a losing battle from second one, 
but we made every effort that we could. And I think that really, you know, starts a lot of mental balls rolling in Lewis, which makes the church death a little bit later that much more difficult. And then Norma down the road and also we'll eventually get to Gage. But um, so I, I think any of those that you guys connect most, most with or find the most interesting for how it plays out in the story, I'd say go for it. Well, I'll start with Pascal. One interesting thing that I liked about his backstory is he had a connection to the Micmacs. Like, uh, he, he, like he's a descendant of them. And so that's, it was an inference that there's some connection for, to Pascal and, and the Micmacs. I thought then, Lewis done like his research and he didn't even come from the area. He was from like he was outside from... of the area. It had nothing to do with it. I forget where I'm hearing them because I remember because I was doing a little studying on it and I'm like later on. I think uh, uh, the inference is just that uh, like his skin was like really super tan or something like that. And I, I'm not sure if King was kind of. Oh, okay. I, I don't know if he was necessarily going for, you know, is he a descendant necessarily of the Micmacs or anything like that? But I, I think, I think one could possibly infer that just by uh, his description of his skin, maybe, but. Gotcha. I, I, I can't, you know, I can't say 100% for sure, though. And it's definitely not something Lewis ever knew, because as far as he could find out, he the kid was not from the area, even remotely. Okay. So, Fair enough. So He grew up I in New Jersey. Okay. Yeah, he yeah. was trying to figure out, um, yeah, he was thinking he was a crazy man, just recalling the, you know, the mortician mm -hmm. and things of that nature, you know, and just, you know, it's like, why are you investigating all this, right? So... I think that's when he like hung the phone up or something. Or... Fair. I, that was one part kind of, I guess. I think, just, yeah, uh, in Lewis's history. head, he was questioning if there was a connection because of the uh, pretty okay. sinister quote that Victor leaves Lewis oh, with. Yeah, how does he area. know about that, right? Because he, yeah, because he mentioned, they, and they don't show that, and I know you guys didn't want to talk about the film, but I, they don't show that in the film, but he says the words Pet Cemetery." If I recall, there's mm -hmm. like, ah, and gah, you know, and then then the soil of a man's heart is stonier. I believe that quote, you know, gets, you know, so Lewis is kind of thinking, hey, you know, how does, how do you know about this, right? And uh, just real quickly, I think that was, Lewis is always getting warned, right? He's about something, right? And this was his first okay. warning, because this is even prior to, you know, Judd with church and things of that nature, but I mean, it's just like he constantly gets warned, don't do this, don't do this, you know, and uh, I think that's that's kind of my biggest take of the Pascal character is uh, he was kind of Lewis's first warning, really, because yeah. he's going to get a lot of them throughout, I think. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Well, and I think, I think it's a pretty reasonable jump to think that Pascal had some connection because he came back from the dead, sort of, in vision form, at least once to Lewis. Like yes, this. yes, okay. the very first night. Or... And Ellie was dreaming about him. Mm -hmm. By yeah. the end of the book, he was talking to Ellie over and over and over again, which is like a whole nother thing with her, yeah. like in how is she connected to all of this. But it's, so it's reasonable to think he's somehow related, or is it just that they, the spirits of the cemetery grabbed the closest dead thing that interacted with these people to try and get them away it's or opposite because he was really warning them against it yeah that, that's what kind of that's what makes me think that he is definitely a descendant of some sort uh yeah, it's just, because he should because he, he's the one that shows up and tells Lewis like he takes him up to the pet cemetery in the vision quote unquote the, in the night and he tells him don't go over the deadfall you know do not go past this point kind of thing and that's yeah where it really kind of kicks up because Lewis wakes up the next morning and his feet are muddy you know the hell you know so how much of a vision was that um so yeah we can i mean we can move on to church uh not much to say about him he was a good cat you know he he, he seemed like a decent cat even after resurrection he, he seemed like a decent he was just uh, odd but yeah, i think uh with church if i, if I may is that uh they have him neutered because uh, Judd had um, basically kind of suggested that to uh, Lewis about having him neutered or, or spayed or whatever back they do, right? To have him fixed, right? So he doesn't wander. But uh, it's pretty much said that 
you know, church, he hangs out by the radiator, goes to his dish, and uh, he sleeps with uh, with Ellie, and that's that's like his day. That's like that's all he ever does. So for him to even head towards uh, Judd's, it, 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 you know, I think that's where that mystical power comes in, because prior to that, we have where uh, L- Lewis saves Norma's life, right, and then now Judd feels compelled to. Uh, you know, share the power, if you will, right? Or, you know, kind of return the favor uh, when when he loses church, right? So, I, but I kind of think it's kind of like that when, you know, the when Dingo's power, you know, whatever the power was happening there. Um, as soon as there's there's a line in there about where when Lewis finally says, okay, if I, if you can ever do me a favor, let's do it, right? And then next, I think like the next section is is our Thanksgiving, you know, after Thanksgiving morning and Lewis is, taking a little nap and then Judd calls him about church. Right. So it was almost like that power had kind of, you know, kind of pushed uh church along to get the story rolling, if you will. And um, yeah, and that's, that's our first, uh, you know, moment of, of grief, if you will. And then of course, it's just going to uh, spiral, spiral into every, into the madness. Absolutely. And I, I think it's important to point out how often things are foreshadowed. Like there's a there's an impending dread on almost every bad thing that happens, right? It's, it's almost like, oh, I really hope my cat doesn't die. I really hope my cat doesn't die. Guess what? The first chance it ha- has to happen, the cat gets run over by a truck. Like that happens, you know, and the same things continue to happen. Like, oh, man, the when, when um, Lewis goes out there to look at the cat, he almost gets hit by the Orinco truck. He almost gets hit by it. And he's like, oh, man, that would be really bad. Guess who gets hit by an Orenko truck later on the story? His son. Mm-hmm. And there's even times where he's like, man, I, I, we got to be careful about, you know, the kids running the street and, you know, it wouldn't take much for Gage to run to the street. And there's just so many of those impending dreads throughout this that it's like you're wishing for these things to happen. Like the cemetery, I think, is listening to you. Like the worst thing that you could have, you know, ask for it's encouraging that to happen. I, there's a lot of it that feels like it's on wheels, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. That uh, it seems like a lot of this is preordained um, what ends up happening, but the fact that it's kind of foreshadowed and most of them, if not all of them, seem to be carried out, I find really, really fascinating because that even if you know something's going to happen, not knowing when it's going to happen can make it feel even worse because it's constantly in your head spinning through. And I think that's just the tone that's set from very early on. Right. And even when Lewis is like, Oh man, I don't think we should be here. We should just move down to Orlando. I'll work at Disney world and uh, you know, all that (laughs) stuff. And it's like, probably should have done that. All right. I want to talk about Judd. (laughs) I, I'd love to talk about Judd myself. I, that's Go for it. I noticed you had a note, and and I have I have some tendencies and leanings about Judd myself. So I'm curious to see what your thoughts are on him. Okay. Well, I I think uh, and uh, out of all the Stephen King, uh, there's been a lot of like I, I guess I'll put Judd in the side character category, and he's made quite a few powerful ones but he's the one that stands out to me the most he's probably one of my favorite characters on a stephen king novel and uh it's and and it's just great because like uh you know at first lewis is he's 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 a doctor and he's trepid about uh even kind of meeting judd because and um and norma uh just because he's like oh the next thing you know they're gonna want him to examine them and stuff like that they got this ailing them and all that kind of stuff right but you know eventually uh, Judd basically becomes the father figure that he that, that he should have had, you know, because he didn't know his father. I think he m- might have known his father at three or something, maybe. Right. Or you know, or he he had the the mortician uncle was more of a father figure because his dad died when he was so young. Absolutely, but I think that and, and it's, it's Star Wars Day, gang. So may the fourth be with you. So and I'll just tell you, I think Judd was our he's kind of our Obi Wan, if you will. Oh yeah. Story, right. He is. He's our world builder, right? He's like the guy that you just, I, I just want to, I just want to sit down and have a few beers with Judd and, you know, like, I don't do that anymore, but uh, I would, you know, you know, you know, in fantasy world or whatever, I'd love to sit down and uh, just have him, you know, tell me about all the folklore, you know? So uh, a lot of times in the scenes, you're, uh, you know, there might be a character in there that's yawning or something, right? Or something, but I'm just still like, oh man, just let him speak. Just let him keep going. I just want to, 
I want more of the world to keep building with them and that. So, um, but yeah, the, I think the most heartbreaking uh, moment with him was when his wife had passed and uh, Lewis came over to uh, comfort him or whatever. And he just broke down crying. And uh, yeah, I did too. I, I have to admit. So, um, you know, cause I would, he was just like such a likable character. You just hated for him to go through this. And, um, but yeah, he's, he's, he's the Obi-Wan character. I think, uh, I think I covered a lot of what I wanted to um, talk about, uh, you know, to begin with Judd anyway. So Melissa. Here's my thing with Judd. I wish it wasn't him who had shown the pet cemetery. That's his character flaw because you're right. He's fantastic. He's, he's the Obi-Wan and he's the, the Gandalf leading them on a journey quest and, and the guy you sit down and smoke your pipe weed with and whatever, but but that character doesn't always have the fatal flaw to show you the dark side, right? They protect you from it. And so I had a hard time, I guess, justifying in my brain, why is Judd doing this when he is such a good, kind soul? And I think it wasn't until like we found out about the other human who had been brought back timmy baderman timmy yeah, yeah. It, it's just timmy. a compulsion it's it, almost like an mm-hmm. addiction to we have to keep trying we have to you, you have to know i don't know so to your point melissa you made me think of it and i put luke i hope i'm not jumping on toes you look like you had a similar thought but it's the dumbledore he cared too much about lewis he cared too much about ellie to let them let her suffer the pain of the cat dying now yes it is the addiction of because he even says later on it's you have to it has to be known i'm the old guy i'm the only one left that knew about this so i had to pass on the information because it's it's just something and that is the fatal flaw but for every good character you need some sort of fatal flaw you can't be all good all the time you know and so like i said with like dumbledore's problem was he cared too much and he wasn't willing to give harry the truth same as judd exact except except opposite he wanted to give the truth because he cared too much about ellie and lewis and the family I so i think at, that's the go ahead Luke. I, I look at judd as being the opposite of a dairy old timer right we talked about the old timers around dairy so much and why are they completely ignoring the the reality of their town right they're completely because they know about it that's that's what i'm saying like he does it the exact opposite way though he knows about this potentially terrible thing or magical essence of what's going on and shares that knowledge right and so he's he's quite literally a foil to what we see in dairy uh in a book that's written two years later than this but um there's again similarities between that type you know that that style of character uh, just in a reverse capacity but i think I mean, I think there's more than just a fatal flaw here. I don't think it's him actively choosing to. I think a lot of what we see isn't people having a chance to choose. I think free will is stripped from a lot of these characters, especially Lewis. And I think in those moments, especially Judd, he knows that he shouldn't do this. And he continuously tells himself, I shouldn't be doing this. But he gets put on tracks. He gets put, he gets railroaded uh, by the cemetery, in my opinion, and no longer has that free will when it comes down to, you know, saving a life or not. The cemetery decides this is what we do. You are doing this because you're the conduit that can make it happen. And I'll just go on with my, the rest of my thought with that. Whenever we see Lewis going through and actually exhuming his dead son's body, he has ample opportunity. He has over and over and over again mental, you know, reservations I shouldn't do this. I can just, I can just leave the leave the grave digging, step over the fence, get back in the car and leave. I can even when you know before he actually cracks open the coffin, he can be like, okay, well, I can just not do it and leave it. Even when he opens the coffin, I can just leave the body here. It's probably gonna fall apart because it was so mangled, and he he continuously has the right idea of don't do this, don't do this, and he's a pretty well educated guy, right? But something is driving him forward. And yeah, maybe it's the grief and the loss that 
it just overcome emotionally overcomes his mental state. But I just feel like between that Judd and when Steve, the guy that comes in at the very end, um, yeah, Masterson, I think it Steve is Steve Masterson. He gets put on those same rails. He almost is convinced to go and help Lewis. Uh, this is obviously at the very end, you know, try it again with uh, Rachel. And he's, he's a fresher he's, option. Hmm? It's a fresher option. Continue. Yeah, it just seems like none of these people, once they're in that fever pitch of this is something that's going to happen, have any chance to pull themselves out of it. And I see Chrissy mentioning it's almost like an addiction. And I think that there is something to that, you know, at least portraying that mentality. So I, that's something that I noticed throughout, which it was why I brought up the foreshadowing consistently on, because I think some of that is ingrained from the cemetery throughout the whole story. It could also be a slight God complex too. Hey, I brought this person back to life or I brought this animal back to life. And that adds to the compulsion aspect of you know making you think i have the power to do this so i'm i must do this and i wonder like if we were talking about jack torrance i think it would be but lewis and judd don't strike me as that type of person does that make sense i think it could absolutely go to the head of a jack torrance but I think these guys, or it's not intentionally that it's, it's, I, I don't know. I, I, I see your thought. And I think there are some people who would, but I don't see Judd like that at all. He's just such genuinely a good old country boy, like open arms, uncle Jim type. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that doesn't make sense for him to do it. If, uh, and I, because I, 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 I'm like half half and half on this because I'm like, yeah, it's I think it's some of it's that God complex, you know, but but a little bit. I think it's just it's like, you know, if we look at like something like Harry Potter, where like the defense against the dark arts job is cursed, right, or mm-hmm. something, right, or, you know, so like there's, you know, every year somebody has to switch out or something like that, right? Exactly. Um, so I, I almost think that like once you have the knowledge of this place, there's some sort of jinx, curse, whatever you call it on this person, that they are going to pass it on when there's an opportunity that comes along, right? So now let's say, you know, church comes along. I, I talked about this just a little earlier where um, as soon as Lewis had said, um, okay, sometime when you can do me that, that a favor, I'll let you do it. And then, you know, church dies and it's almost like that that curses or that curse or that jinx or whatever it is um, is now in action now, right? Mm-hmm. And and now Judd is forced sort of not necessarily against, you know, and that, that's where we're kind of like, you know, is it the God complex? Is it just Stephen King saying, hey, this character's screwed right now? And um, you know, he's he's gonna he's gonna do he's gonna pass along the power to to uh, Lewis. And I think it's really, I think it's really symbolic. I don't know if you folks caught this or maybe I'm kind of crazy on this too, but, but I think it's like when you notice uh, when, when they're actually walking to the grave, uh, Judd has the pick, right? It's like, he, he's the guy that does the picking, right? He picked out the, the new guy to, to pass the power to, and then Lewis has the shovel, mm-hmm. right? So I don't know. You know I, I just kind of found that kind of interesting about him having the pick and Lewis having the shovel, but, uh, and, and, Luke, you brought that out. That's totally what I was thinking there at the end. Cause I'm going, okay, this, this curse is passed on from folks like Stanny B to Judd, uh, Judd now to Lewis. There's other folks that know it too, of course, but um, it's Steve. I think it's Steve Masterson there at the end um, where uh, Lewis has gone absolutely crazy now. And, but there's, for some reason uh, that, you know, he, he doesn't agree to, to keep moving forward and he just stays the hell out of Ludlow. And, you know, he doesn't even want to talk about it ever again, right? But that was the one, he was the, one, the one guy that that escaped the curse sort of thing. But he but he never returned to Ludlow, they said. So I know I rambled a bit there, folks, but... Uh, oh, you're fine. You're fine. Oh, no, yeah. you're good. I'm almost wondering, we're, we're talking about addiction. We're talking about the pullet. This is not any addiction. This is gambling. Yeah. That's what this is, right? They gambled. Uh, Judd gambled with his dog. He came out pretty even, right? Like a give and take. 
uh, they gambled with Tim, one guy. Mm -hmm. That didn't work at all. It was it was, it was like over. weeks, and he was shipped over from Europe in the war. Yeah. Like that was just like way so, like, way long time. Yeah. They gambled with Church, worked out. They gambled with Gage, that was less than successful. Yeah. <laughs> Gamble with the bull, you know. Right. Harambe, or, uh, oh, Hammerati, right? Hammerati. Yeah. Yeah, Hammerati. Thank you. So I just, I don't know. I'm, because once you do it once and it's kind of working for you, or you come out at a loss like you did with Gage, like you want to try again to break even. It's a scientific yeah. process, right? How, what, what could I, what could I do slightly differently to up my odds? Is it odds or is it literally a skill? You know, that's is there kind a of. Ability factor. Right. Is, is it time? That's what Lewis was going with. Like right. the amount of time between death and burial, like ancient ritual burial, does that contribute to the process? I, see, like this is not just a random addiction. This is this is like a mathematical gambling type of logical, only faulty logic, but logical, like I know I can get this right if I just have the right set of circumstances. Mm-hmm. It was like, yeah, and that's 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 what I love about this novel too, is that because it gives you, as the reader, just just this little false hope. As we hear Lewis's ideas of the analyzing this and that, if I could have just done this better, if I could have done done it this way, oh, they didn't do it this way, so it's you know it's gonna you know and it's just um, it really gives you that even by the end when you just know it's not even gonna work for Rachel, right? There's still even that little bit of false hope that maybe it worked this time and. Uh, and speaking of, of, yeah, but speaking of false hope, that kind of goes right into my next note. Section 40. Now, Luke, you're the only one that was new to this entirely. Did you, in the first like paragraph and a half or two, did you take the bait? Did you think? Hold on, hold on. But okay. none of these things happened. All of them, the droning Orinko truck, the fingers that just touched the back of Gage's jumper and then slid off. Rachel preparing to go to the viewing in her house coat, Ellie carrying Gage's picture and putting it on the chair next to her bed. Blah, 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 blah. Um, it goes on. This is the part where Lewis put on a final burst of speed and leaps, throwing himself out straight and parallel to the ground like a football player to make about to make a tackle. He could see his shadow tracking along the grass. Blah, blah, blah. Lewis's fingers brushed the back of his jacket and then snagged it. He yanked Gage backwards and landed on the ground on and on and on. And Gage went to grammar school. And at the age of seven, he began going to camp where he showed a wonderful and surprising aptitude for swimming. Yeah. And on and on. And on. Yeah. And so, like, my main question to that, because honestly, rereading this, because in one of the adaptations, they do play with that trope or play with that a bit. I'm not, I can't remember exactly which one. And so reading this, and when I got to this part again, and I'm like, wait a second, is this, a, am I wrong about the ending of this? Because I know I've read this before. Am I wrong about this? And then it goes on to the full life. Okay, I'm like, okay, fine. But in those first two paragraphs, it made me like second guess myself. I was just wondering your thoughts if that so stood out to you. You're asking if I caught on to the false future thing. Um, or if you believed it. Not at all. I mean, I don't remember the exact context leading up to that but there was something definitive before that that solidified to me i don't remember exactly what it was i didn't get that far into my reread this morning but I, no, yeah to me it was without a doubt not true it was it was okay. in lewis's head mentally wishing that was going to be the truth and I, yeah the way he was already pretty scatterbrained on certain things and wishful thinking on other things this just felt like Oh, and if we move down to Orlando, we could have this life. And I think it's Sorry. right along those lines that I just I knew instantly that not a chance sure. that that's happening. That is not the way no, this book I, is going. And I I, I was like ninety nine percent, but I'm like, did I forget? Like it just honestly made me like question myself just from seeing everything else. Uh, but I because the the context really was the night because the last chapter was he was getting drunk after the wake but before the day before the funeral so this is the night before the funeral where he sat and drank like half a case of beer or like full case of beer oh, to yeah, himself. It was clearly a dream right we we pretty much knew that yeah, yeah like because it goes from that section to and then none of that happened and blah 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 and i'm just like that's what i just wonder if it made anybody if it ever wants to give anybody pause 
I, I loved, uh, he does this a lot. That's why, especially in this book, I don't know if folks know this a lot, but like he'll, like something so har- harrowing or just terrible will happen, or we might, you know, be told that, hey, this is going to happen. It's going to be terrible, but he'll start branching off in like another little s- story, like, oh, wow, you know, Gage made it. He became an uh, Olympic swimmer, right? And mm-hmm. all this stuff. And he had uh, a, a wife Catholic that, girlfriend, uh, Rachel yeah. didn't like. And, and uh, then, then we, you know, we, we hear about how he had caught him and he fell down and hurt himself. And he, and, and there's like a little joke in there that he'll, he'll, to like even bring you back to like humor a little bit right where he tells rachel well i think i'm sterile now honey or something like that right where you know about the jock strap thing right so but then right right after that right we hear about uh uh gage is talking about like when he was going i think up to the uh, stand or something he's like well let's cap this off right and that's just that's some that's some dark stephen king you know let's cap this off because the cap is filled with blood Right. So, and then, you know, so he's like, you know, and then, but it's just a beautiful rendition of what a person would go through, you know, a person goes through with grief, the, the what ifs, right. The what ifs and the, and the just, it, it, it didn't happen. The, the, the denial of, of what occurred. Right. And then the what ifs, of course, and then just the, just the madness that would go with something like that of losing a little one like that. So. But yeah, that, 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 those are just some powerful, uh, rough, right? You know, just uh, to get through as a reader. Cause, and just the, yeah, the play on the play with, he'll play with your emotions there, right? It's like terrible things are happening. Let's go off in this little story, put a little, you know, pepper it with a little humor and then hit them and, hard. And realism, right? Rachel didn't like the, the girlfriend and he got hurt. And, you don't imagine those negative things. Anything you yeah. imagine, anything you dream about, you're going to be the happy, positive. That's all. So the fact that Stephen King peppers in little bits of reality and you know pepper in this pretty, pretty land of salt, right? Sprinkles of negativity makes you feel like it's real. Absolutely, is, yeah. It certainly allows you to suspend, you know, belief in it a little bit, and it just gives a little bit more uh, depth that it's easy to err on the side of believability with that. And I think it's pretty well done. Like you said, he does it pretty consistently. And uh, it's just, it's one of those things that good writers do that. It's one of those things. It's like an intangible thing. You don't realize it until you've already read it twice. And you're like, that was one of the things that makes this good. That was one of them. I didn't realize it. All right. Last chance. I think we've got one or two more thoughts. And then I oh, can move on to my question. Uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll let you Oh, sure. Uh, just real quickly, I know we were talking about our favorite moments, and uh, like I, I think I, I mentioned to you guys, I had read this book uh, probably when I was about 15. Mm-hmm. Um, I read, I'd read it a few times, but like my favorite, it was like one of the scariest moments I had read in a book was uh, uh, section 27. It's like page 170 on whatever uh, PDF I'm using here, but um, it's where Lewis, uh, I believe he just, uh, Church was just resurrected. He goes over there, has a few beers uh, uh, with Judd, and Judd tells him the story, you know, how the pet cemetery works and all that stuff. And it was right after, I think, when he asked him about, hey, did anybody ever put a, a human up there? And, you know, he's like, Christ on his throne, no, you know. But uh, but Judd, or but basically Lewis comes back, and he's in the garage. And it just reminded me of, you know, hey, being in the dark, and you don't know where the heck shit is. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, but at the same time, he has this creepy thing that he, he doesn't know how creepy it is or, you know, and he's just the whole time he's going, where the hell is this cat at? And, uh, and, and then again, just how he talked about just a little bit earlier, he kind of goes off on another tangent a little bit. Right. And then he brings you right back into what's going on. And the next thing you know, this cat's uh, curled up around his ankle and leg, uh, kind of, you know, uh, kind of going back to where they, they would talk about, you know, uh, what you bought, you owned, and, uh, you know, what you owned usually had a way of coming back to you, right? And this thing is, he said, you know, then he, they said it was curled up around him like a snake. Um, and uh, then he just starts screaming, right? And they were just like, he was screaming, he was screaming. So I just, I always love that scene, uh, just because of the creepiness at, at first, you know, but now when I look back on it now, it was, it was such a metaphor for what was about to happen uh, moving forward. And I think, you know, uh, after I done a little, did a little research on this, because I know this was, 
uh, I think Stephen King said this was kind of his retelling of a, a short story called The Monkey's Paw. Mm-hmm. And uh, and there's a kind of a scene in The Monkey's Paw where the monkey's paw basically curls around the lady's uh, hand kind of like a snake too. So I was thinking it was almost like uh, his kind of his salute to that uh, uh, to that uh, book as well. And the only other real quick uh, thing, one of my favorite uh, is uh, the very beginning of uh, part two, his writing about the horrors, you know, that the human mind can, uh, you know, can take and uh, things of that nature. Because we just uh, learned about what's going to happen to Gage, basically, right? And then, then he kind of leads into part two. And the boy, the first paragraph is just, just amazing. Amazing. I agree. So you did have one other note here that I was going to touch on uh, as well with you, but uh, you, it, we're going to mention Zelda and the Zelda storyline, especially for the movie watchers is one that everybody remembers the Zelda storyline on that book wise. It's done very well. Uh, a lot of people want to put blame on the parents because they left Rachel, you know, she was what seven or eight with Zelda, you know, who was uh, a 10 or 11 at the time for just an evening we've all kind of been there as parents just like okay you know what you're you're old enough you know how to take care of your sister just do whatever we have to get the hell out of the house because she's driving us nuts too and this and that and and keep in mind this was also in the 1950s and 60s when yes. it was like, like it was a lot it was a very different time with leaving kids too so i always try to exactly. remember that yeah and zelda you know she's she's made up to like from rachel's point of view and i get it she's an evil character quote unquote you know from rachel's point of view because she's like she would laugh she would you know piss herself after she, she refused the bedpan she'd laugh and all and but really it's just it with that situation she's one of the more sympathetic characters in the book because there's no control over it yeah if you're stuck in that situation yeah you're probably going to become an asshole you know it, it, it's just it, it's unfortunate but i i, I always did dig that storyline as well yeah, absolutely, Ben. And um, the book Zelda is totally different than, I mean, yeah, she's creepy as heck at the end of it, of course, but, uh, uh, you know, but the, the way that her her backstory, all that stuff is introduced, and uh, I felt really sad for Zelda at, at, and, and Rachel as well, right? But they said, I think Rachel was only, what, 8 or 11, maybe? Was that correct, guys? Yeah. Do you guys remember? Like eight I, or I believe, like, 8 or 9. nine. Like, and, I, and I'm looking back at what King would do. He's going to find the stuff that would creep you out, what the stuff that's underneath the bed at night, right? And and what would kind of creep, you know, a, a kid at that age out it would be something like that. It, you know, I, not to be, you know, I, I think it's just kind of a reality thing until kids get a little more uh, – experience with 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 things of that nature right it's gonna things like that creep them out at times right so uh, well, it, it goes back to the conversation we had when we read it little kids yeah. have tangible fears yeah right and you know and kids can be mean too of course too right but not not that rachel was mean to her or anything but uh still she was you know creeped out about her and and, and she shouldn't have had to have been put in that position but um it really that, that was really uh what drove Rachel to her fear of death, really, right? And her fear of talking about death. And, um, but I think it really, and also really quickly, um, it also shows uh, the, the different ways that folks um, deal with grief, right? We look at Erwin, Ir- Irwin and Dory, right? Correct? Uh, I think that's uh, Dory is his wife's name, I believe. Uh, you know, how, they, how they deal with grief is different than the way, you know, our other characters do, right? And, uh, you know, because by the end, you know, Dor- you know, uh, Irwin's, you know, pretty much balling and uh, really hit hard. And Lewis is just, you know, Lewis is gone by then. Though. Lewis is, he's Dr. Frankenstein by then. So, but uh, yeah, great stuff there, guys. Any other thoughts before I jump into my book club questions? Let's do it. All right, here we go. Question number one. So glad you ended with, with Rachel and, and her conversation because that feeds right into my question i would say anybody who gets buried up in the pet cemetery is going to come back a little whacked i'm i'm not discounting that but specifically it being rachel because she is so terrified of death and has such like a mortal fear of it how does that impact zombie rachel if you will coming back 
See, my only thought on that is, is she aware she's a zombie? You know, like, because it's it's one of those of, because we the only interaction we get really is from Timmy or Gage, who both came back pretty much demonic, because they'd been in the ground for so long, you know, been dead for so long. Potentially, that was the reason. Well, th that's what we're here to, that's what we are to assume, kind of thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, so if it did work with Rachel, would she even know that she was, you know, buried and dead and everything like that? So that that's where my brain kind of goes to it is it would fall into that. If she knew, Luz is dead. Because how dare you kill me or, you know, I die and then you bring me up just so I can die again, you know. But if she doesn't know, I don't know. I, I think it's a good question of, you know, it, how many people are out there that have been, you know, medically considered dead and survived, you know, and were brought back uh, by the doctor on scene that gave him CPR and like that happens. And like, it's just, it's just a gap, right? I don't remember, you know, Harry Potter when he dies, uh, you know, I didn't really go anywhere. I'm just still here. Um, so I don't know if it would be any different for her if she truly has, you know, blood pumping again, if it's just, it depends on what the nature of the science behind the resurrection, right? Like, is it still like a blood pumping body and, or is it truly, you know, sludge in the veins, zombie, zombification like, or ghoulification if you want. And it just depends on how that works. But I, I think to me, I feel like she seems pretty normal. We only get one word from her, right? The last line in the whole book, and it just says darling. And that's, it can be taken very ominously, right? Comes up, puts her hand on his shoulder and just says darling, or it can be proof of concept that maybe it did work. That's technically how I read it. I think it, I think it does fall under, you know, I, I think she, it's a much more successful resurrection, um, probably due to the timing of it. And also maybe the nature of how she was killed compared to being obliterated by a truck. Um, stab wounds are a little easier to overcome. Um, but also somebody in the chat earlier had mentioned, um, do you, what happens when you try to bring back a body that's been embalmed? That, I was, yeah, yeah I was going totally. to bring that up as well. because That's what I love about the, uh, the concept. Cause as a reader, we're asking those questions too. And so then ambiguously, Lewis, it's so well he's, done. He's doing what we are asking him to do. We were, we were just like, yeah. oh, you know, it was because this, you know, Timmy Baderman was three weeks, right? Gage was embalmed, right? But Rachel just died, right? I think, I think she was stabbed and I don't know how much she was eaten, but I think it was kind of inferred that Gage ate her a little bit. Oh yeah, bit, I forgot about that. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I don't, I, you know, cause I, boy, that's a, that's a eerie scene right there when he was like, uh, yeah. when he, oh boy when he's looking over at her body right so yeah. but uh, uh back to the first time i had read this book i was so just i you know it's just i was just crushed by the grief and 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 just kind of in awe if you will right but i i still had this false hope that rachel had come out all right but i firmly believe that's just my own opinion that that, that the ground is sour right the the, the wendigo uh, possessed it right so anything that gets buried in there it's it's his it's him now basically right and and back to what, what kind of drives it home for me a little bit is like uh we have rachel put her cold hand i think it was it was like her cold hand or they said the touch was cold something to that nature if you guys I think are so. the book there i think there's something where there's an inference of cold Mm -hmm. A cold the, hand fell on Lewis's shoulder. Then the, then the gurgling sound from the dirt. The, her Rachel's voice was grating, full of dirt. Grating, Dar darling, it said. Yeah, yeah. And, and then yeah, it said right. And then yes, <laughs> yeah. So grating, it said, and uh, oh, the cold, right? It's so like, when you put those kind of things together, I'm just like, oh, I feel. I, I don't know if it's necessarily gonna destroy Lewis. But what, you know, what he owned definitely came back home to him. And I think that's really my point of it's she's not perfect, right? She's not back to absolute normal. That's that's not at all what I meant. It was more of I don't think she is a direct threat to killing him like Gage was. And like Timmy, they called him a monster that a demon had come back. And that's where I, I feel like it's maybe a bit more on the church 
side, the Churchill, where it's, you know, yeah. maybe a little more docile, maybe maybe a little you know. clumsier, but essentially not uh, dangerous. So my one question to the whole thing really quick with the gauge as well that just bothers me because he's the doctor. He should know, just saying, morphine, if you do, you're embalmed, you have no blood, you have no blood flow, morphine shouldn't have killed him. Just saying. Like, it just, to me, that doesn't make, like, medical sense of he has no blood, he has no blood flow, you know, that should not have killed him. Church, absolutely. Technically resurrected, you know, with blood, that's fine. I, I don't know, just that, that one little bit just kind of, like, damn it. Of course, yeah, I find one little thing. That's back, your like, reb yeah. rum of this book? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we ever get reb rum. Yep. King someday, well, well, I'm going to have to ask him that one. I'm going to write that one down. That's a good one, <laughs> You know, because now, hey, you know, if uh, they're very, you know, when Timmy Baderman come back, did he have normal, you know, was he back yeah. to A positive or whatever, right? I don't know. Like, well, yeah, they completely. Yeah. Undead were negative. they embalming back during World War One? you know, for the soldiers coming yeah. back? Were they? World War II. No, he was. Oh, he was too? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think yeah. he died in 43, they said. Like, yeah, 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 he was yeah, yeah. on his way to take Rome. I That's think right. I'm too naive. I. I like, I think she's going to be weird. I think it's going to be like Ellie is going to hate it. And I think eventually Lewis and Ellie might leave her just because it'll be so uncomfortable. Like, imagine that's your wife and like that thing sleeping next to you every night. That's going to be a little twisted. But like the naive, hopeful side of me is like, but she's back and it's going to be livable. Right. I don't know. It's That's a bit like the resurrection stone in Harry Potter, right? We always come back to Harry yeah. Potter, but it's you get a shade of what that person once was. It's not really them. It's close and maybe you can lie to yourself, but it's it's not the same. Yeah. And that's that's actually what he had said about church was it's it's church's body, but that's not church. And we can infer that yeah, Rachel would be at least the same as how church was. I, I hope you folks are right and she's okay <laughs> now and they can figure out how to get Gage back and Judge. No, I love Judge. He can just be dead. We can, Gage can Dude, just Gage. be dead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Ellie. What kind of supernatural element was there that allowed Ellie off in Chicago to know what was happening? Ooh, that girl's got the shine. Yeah. Right? That's oh yeah. yeah. That's... Absolutely. That, that's yeah. how I so see it at least. Just... Yeah, you know, I, and, and I was going back to I really did think that Pascal, I know they they really don't tell us hundred percent. More than likely he might not be, but I just think he really did have some sort of connection to that. Um you know, to the cemetery, things of that nature, right? And he was kind of the you know, the good spirit sort of to try to try to help us. Or to try to help our heroes um so yeah was she not necessarily danny torrance you know maybe you know maybe you know it'd be kind of interesting to see if king ever did a sequel of this sometime but um yeah. see what happened to ellie but <laughs> or maybe her and danny hook up there you but, go yeah, great you know i did guys i didn't even think about uh danny torrance or <laughs> reference to that but I, I almost thought uh yeah it was i almost just thought it was you know he's connected to that He's a descendant of of them, and so he was trying to warn their daughter somehow. But yeah, she might be. She might have the shine. I I don't see what else it could be other than maybe she had like a spark of the shine, or like you know how little kids are kind of better at reading the room than adults, just in general. Maybe it's that combined with like like she's been in a charging zone. That the pet cemetery and and the surrounding Native American lands are almost like an amplifier, and so her magical skills... waystone type idea. Yeah, yeah. and not that he's there right now, but she's been powered up and it's tuned into her family. To be completely yeah. fair, Rachel also likely has the shine. Yeah, yeah, because she made some comments to Pascal coming to her as well. You know, making similar comments and everything. I was going to say the same thing and uh, go back to a point Chrissy made in the chat earlier in the evening. It's funny that Rachel's the only one that noticed the sign to Salem's Lot on their way into town. 
mm-hmm. you know, she she made a point to say, oh, that place sounds nice. It sounds like a nice you place, know? yeah. We, we also got reference to Cujo. Don't go there. There were about, I don't know how many, I don't know how many of you folks caught, I, I just, off the top of my head, I remember they referenced Cujo mm-hmm. in the beginning, I think, and I remember Jerusalem's lot being mentioned. There, boy, there was a few other ones I thought yeah. in there too. Uh, maybe fire. I think fire. Dairy. Dairy. The first time we Dairy uh, was yeah. mentioned. Dairy mention. I yeah. think Dairy was mentioned in Cujo too, right? Oh, was there? They don't know oh, that okay. one. Is. So I thought that was kind of neat. Awesome. Yeah, I, that's like my favorite thing about King in general is that the deeper and deeper you go, the more and more references you find to other works. Okay. Mm-hmm. Question three. Who is at fault in this story and who is the biggest victim? Um, Okay. Uh, I I have the fault and I can't remember his name now. The guy who showed Judd. Stan. Stan. Yeah. Stan. Because had he not shown Judd, none of this happens yeah know. but then but you can blame stan's on. dad who's the one that showed him and it just well, continues true. up the well, line it we blame history but i'm not gonna <laughs> blame anybody for their actions on this because it is understandable through grief and through loss to want to try to do this you know is it the right thing to do no but is it understandable the the want to try yeah so I feel like I, just I about everyone here is a victim. I, I really do. I yeah. feel like the cemetery itself is the only thing I can look at as blame everything else. Like I said, I, I look at a lot of this as being put on rails by the cemetery. Even the horrible things that Lewis does, I don't think he necessarily had a... I think he lost all free will when it came down to it. And whether or not that makes him innocent, I don't know. But it's hard for me to really say that he actively did those things i don't know it's it's tough more ambiguous yeah. across the board i agree with you folks uh, i i think basically this is man versus the you know the mystical if you will right uh or you know some supernatural thing right but now you know where where the depths of that lie i know that's opened up a lot of conversations where that you know folks are thinking oh it was you know when the when the white settlers came in and we're trying to push the natives out kind of thing mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and then then we get the we get the assumption of cannibalism possibly happening, right? And you know, was it at that point that you know w- was that the issue that happened here, or was it just was it just the Wendango basically all along? Um, which is kind of what I think it is. I think that you know, if I had to pick a main antagonist for this film or for this uh, novel, excuse me, you know, it'd be the Wendango. Uh, okay. Yeah, but that's uh, yeah, it's kind of a that's an interesting uh, topic for sure. Uh, that's great. the biggest victim. And then oh yeah, then the biggest victim, um, boy yeah, I want to say Lewis, but really when you look at it, Ellie, Ellie has lost everything. You know, out of you know, I think you know she was kind of our first introduction into the fear of death, and by the end of it, you know, pretty much everybody that was around her, other than her, uh, the grand folks that we weren't really too uh, hip to. Um, you know, she was kind of left with them, but uh, yeah, I think the biggest victim would be Ellie, possibly, and Lewis, of course. But I, I think yeah. I think you you nailed it with that one. I think Ellie. I mean, and I think the one thing I could look at Lewis specifically doing wrong of his own choice has to do around church, right? It has to do with resurrecting church and li- not telling Ellie anything about it and keep withholding that information. I think that's probably his biggest thing that he's responsible for directly um but other things wouldn't play there but yeah i mean i I definitely think she she loses her cat right then she loses her brother then she loses her home that she's just getting comfortable in and getting to know kids at school they just moved here that's a hard time for a little kid any at any age right then moves in with her grandparents dad loses his mind mom's dead uh yeah no that's the neighbor grandpa figure is dead right absolutely and grandma yep yeah and she was pretty much there for all of that (laughs) yeah so that's a pretty rough like you said when she comes in just with this slight curiosity and or ignorance to death she sure gets a few a couple heaps full of it uh pretty early in her life you know 
a, less than a year later from asking that first initial question, this is a pretty rude awakening to what that can truly entail for some one person. Her, um, her change when church comes back from how, how her fear of, of the cat dying to her, it'd be okay if he died, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And right. Just, uh, Apathy. One of a, a touching moment there. So. All right. I have one last question. Usually I pick my top three questions and eliminate the fourth in case we talk about it, but this is important. Does Lewis ever make it to Disney World? Yes. With Rachel. Because <laughs> she's going to, she's going to be a character in the Pirates of the Caribbean. Fits perfectly. <laughs> she's gonna be an audio animatronic. All right. No, because she's walking dead, like the Pirates of the Caribbean folks. The Pirates on Par Pirates of the Caribbean are walking dead. So Yeah, I'm just she, saying she could work there just like the audio animatronics, since yeah. there's no real people in there. She just she can work for the film now. Luke? Oh, sure. Yeah, why not? Like I said, they're, they're going to be doing just fine. They'll be all right. See, they can go to I think he and Ellie abandon Rachel and leave her to her poor zombie ways, and she's so confused, and then they go there. You don't think they put but her as, down? But, but as they say, you know, she'll follow. You know, she he said, I'll just leave Gage, and but, but the cat always comes back. You know, like... But that's the, to the home. I don't know. No, that's to him. He, he sewed it. He grew it. It's he, it's tied to him, so it will it will uh, follow him across the nation. He mentioned he because there was a time when he was just gonna leave. I think it was right when uh, he realized when he saw the the footprints, right? And there was a he was got a thought of just packing up and going, right? But he was like, nope, he'll find me down in Florida. It, 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 oh. it, will, come, it will come and get me. All right, right. So, all right. Time, just real. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, what happens there at the end? Yeah, um, Rachel comes back. She is fine, right? And she has now this mystical power and and um, and knowledge, right, to uh, figure out how to how to get it to work for Gage and Judd as well. And they all come back and take a trip to Disney World. Oh heck, you know, let's bring Norma back too. And um, <laughs> that, that's my ending, folks. The happy. Well, it sounded like Norma was having fun on her own, you know, where she was at, from according to Gage. I don't, I don't believe that though. But. That's the one time I think he was lying. Like, yeah. cause the wind dingo thing that with Timmy, I, I did have this point, but up, since we're kind of coming around it, I'm not going to be as graphic, but mm -hmm. you know, when, with Timmy, he spoke all truths. I don't think Gage was, I think Gage was just trying to get to oh, yeah. uh, Judd. It was there, that yeah. exorcist moment, right? Yeah. When, uh, you know, yeah. But I love how they puts that spin in there because yeah, we know that the Wendigo you know, or the Wendigo knows all, and uh, it, it will tell you truths. Why does it have reason to lie, right? And so yeah. it does make you think. Oh man, was he really telling the truth there and stuff like that? I don't think. Uh, I don't think Norma was doing that. I don't think so either. But uh, yeah. Okay. Powerful scene though. Next section. These are a few of my favorite things. So what was your favorite part of this book? What was the thing that stood out? And Doug, I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, I said earlier, yeah, like my favorite part of that book was where uh, Lewis was um, in the garage, you know, and kind of it was kind of a metaphor of, uh, you know, what was happening or what was about to happen, right? He, you know, he was kind of lost in the dark, had no idea, starts banging around on stuff, starts thinking about you know, the way life might have been, you know, or something or some other tangent he goes off on. Now this cat is, uh, you know, curled around his leg and he's screaming for dear life. Um, but, you know, so that was kind of like my, my favorite scene, just the creepiness of it, the, the, the foreshadowing of what was about to happen. And, uh, boy, some of the powerful writing that like Ben had talked about earlier too, with, uh, uh when he was thinking about, you know, where, you know, what what could have, what the way it could have been with Gage things of that nature, but uh, boy, if uh, if folks if you ever do pick up this book, I, I really love the the beginning of uh, part two, um, and the 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 the, the way he writes, uh, you know, the horror and you know how the, how the human mind can take the horror and things of that nature, and uh, you know it was just kind of telling us that you know from this point on. Uh, things are going to get bad and they're going to get even worse and they're going to get even worse and even worse. Right. And, uh, just, yeah, just, uh, just 
just a oh, yeah, just an amazing uh, journey, just a well, hell of a ride. Benji, I don't want cat. I don't want Church to die. He's not gonna die. God can have his own cat. Church is mine. And reading or hearing the preamble written by King, and that was a direct line, according to him, from his seven-year-old daughter at the time. You know, worried about that. It's just that is such such a cool line. It just I absolutely love it. It's like, yeah, God, you know, God could do whatever the fuck he wants. This is my cat, you know. And it's like, yeah. So that that that, that one stood out to me just from the get go, from the jump. Everything in this book is awesome. But all right, Luke. I I just want to highlight something the dog said. I I really love the writing in this book. It again, this is not the first time it's made me feel this way in reading some of King's early books like this. There's a very much a an Edgar Allan Poe type uh, terror going on, especially the interior anguish that people deal with. I just want to highlight that that is very, very evident in this book throughout, uh, probably more so than any of the other ones even, but just really, really well done on that. But my favorite thing, and it's a, it's basically a character, but uh, it, it, it stems from this line. Oh, about beer, I never lie, Crandall said. A man who lies about beer makes enemies. <laughs> it's just one of those lines when you're a beer guy yeah. you hear that that's gonna be like on my gravestone before you guys resurrect yeah. me so we will probably make t-shirts about that a man who lies yeah. about beer makes enemies but how uh, can you not love judd after that line he, right? he, I, I love I judd cradle he's uh, he's, luke, he's, you, he's great uh luke um was that like right after like when when uh when Lewis was kind of feeling trepid about, you know, heading over and meeting Judd and stuff yeah. like it's, that. It's but... like the first day that he goes over yeah. uh, to follow up because he offers him the beer when they first meet. And he's like, well, I come out about nine o'clock every night. Uh, don't, don't think you need an invitation like this. You have an open invitation. And so he's like, you know what? I'm pretty tired, but I'll go over and have a beer. And he checks in with, and Lewis checks in with Judd. And he's like, is that, you know, is that beer offer still, still on the table? And he cradles like, absolutely i don't lie about beer <laughs> yeah yeah it's great i just yeah i love that character too he just reminds me of so many people in our family oh yeah <laughs> yeah i think like, you said it right with like uncle jim or uncle um, tom yep uncle tom grandpa was, like yeah, grandpa doc, yeah. yeah. Th th it, this it, is family <laughs> what this is a family man this is this is someone that fits in with us for sure yeah it, it, it's just that's because they're just that person and that genuinely, they really mean it. They really want you there. They really, I, it, yeah, it, it's very familiar. Okay, my favorite part was the scene with the kite. The oh, only yeah. happy scene in the whole book. <laughs> Kindergarten was good. The only extended optimistic scene. But here's the thing that I like the best about it. You say extended. It was absolutely dripping with, but it all's downhill from here. This is the last happy thing. Very few happy things. Right? The, 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 the book starts out unhappy. The book ends unhappy. Very few happy things happen in the middle. This is the one happy thing. So you better enjoy it because there is no more happy after this point. It, it was very lemony snicket in that and yeah i was very excited i was like oh this and then and then it was this is the last time he remembers being happy and my heart just drops i'm like can't, can't you just give me the day just give me the day just let me be happy in like this moment don't ruin it anyway i will say at least they one thing king could have done is literally right after the kite scene truck comes wham it would have just been that really hard sucker punch, you know? But that's okay, too. Like, I, then it would have been right. No, it's like when he looked back, I think yeah. it was like, look back from like two weeks from now, look back when he was 70. What do you mean when he looked back on this time? <laughs> what does that look like? I, I love that um, also because it's, it's it, yeah, it's kind of a tearjerker a little bit, too, because, you know, you hear – gate oh i'm flying kites dad all that you know and it's just like and you're just totally picturing this right and then because yeah i love melancholy too and it's just so well done because in there he just like yeah this is going to be like you know this son only has like two weeks to live or something like that he just like melissa said he literally is going to tell you that nothing is 
I'm going to, I'm going to take all the happiness out of the world here. Right. And it's going away. Just like the Dementors are just going to come right in and uh, that's what's happening. And you're looking at this book and you're going, Holy cow, there's a lot of book left. Right. And it's like, <laughs> there's a, well, there's a lot of, of, uh, of, of grief to come. I think this book hit me really hard because I'm a parent reading it this time. When I read it when I was younger, I wasn't. And so it was scary and it was sad and it was, but this is like, that moment happens in every parent's life. Not necessarily the, oh, two weeks from now, my kid's getting hit by a truck, but the, this is the last time we're gonna whatever. And you don't know it's the last time. I don't know, you don't know when the last time your kid was gonna ask, I mean, it's gonna be dumb things, but like the last time your kid asked you to tie their shoe, when was the last, like, when's the last time your kid crawls into your bed because they had a nightmare, right? So like, it's it's little things like that, that as my kids are now getting older because my youngest is seven and my oldest turns 15 on Wednesday, like as my kids are getting older, I'm hitting a lot more lasts than I am firsts. And that's the thing that's hard because Lewis gets to look back. I don't know when my lasts are. And so I'm like, it, it was hitting me in the feels, but I don't cry. So that didn't happen. <laughs> Parenting, in a word, is bittersweet. <laughs> Always. Okay. <sighs> Are you guys ready? Yep. Kind of. Okay. It's a tough one. This is a tougher one. <laughs> this is a very tough so, one. This is the time where the three of us go through and we decide, based on all the books we have read on this show, where does this one fall? To give everybody an overview, currently, it is still ranked number one. The Shining is number two, Cujo is three, Salem's Lot is four, and Carrie is five. Blah, blah. So what we're going to do now is hover over your box. You can pick any number, one through six. Don't hit enter yet. Where do you think this falls? Basically, like, what does it fall under? And then give it that number, right? So if you think it's number five, then you're going to hit five, and then it replaces Carrie, and Carrie moves down, or whatever you think. Are you ready? Are we in? Are we in? Benji in? All right, go. Oh, I knew it. Yeah. I almost went too. Like it, I it's was. Str- hard, it was. It was tough. It was, it was tough. Very tough. So the rankings, Melissa but gives this it a still three. Makes it... I gave it a one. Ben gave it a one. Yes. This becomes the number one book ranked. No. It, yes, it average. Does. Average is two. No, no, no. You have to. We actually have a formula in there. It, it the has. To... Oh, okay. Yeah, it, huh. it's in there. It, the way it's, we okay. agree. It, the way it has to work. If two people give it a one, and the number, it it, it gets weighted up. It gets weighted gotcha. to okay. being better. Fair. So really, the way Carrie can be <laughs> taken out is if all three of us give it last place, whatever the new book is. But okay. I think it's harder to be considered better. So, yeah, yeah I I think this has way fewer problems in it than it did um i think it hits on every level that it tries to incredibly well and it's just a tighter narrative to me yes it it is more expansive and it's a greater endeavor but this one knows what story it's supposed to be and it tells that story perfectly and that's just kind of where I, I I fall. Like it was a very hard struggle. I mean, like I told Luke, I'm like I really like this book. Like I told him this last week, I'm like I don't know where I'm gonna fall though. And yeah, with this one, this is one. It I probably will go back and reread in like 15, 20 years. I'll probably reread this in two to three years because I enjoy this story. Listen, your mm. thoughts. When I am asked, as I frequently am, what I consider to be the most frightening book I have ever written, the answer I give comes easily and with no hesitation, Pet Cemetery. It may not be the one that scares readers the most, but the fear born, the fear bone, like the funny bone, is located in different places and different people. All I know is that Pet, Pet Cemetery is the one I put away in the drawer thinking I had finally gone too far. This yeah. book is like that for me. And I probably won't read it again. And because of that, that's why I ranked it at a three because I will read it again and I will read The Shining again. I don't think I'll read any of the other ones again, at least not for another 20 something years. So 
that's how I read it because I won't be revisiting this book. It's not in my wheelhouse of like, man, this is one that I just have to keep coming back to. This is a, I'm going to put you in a shelf in a box with a lock because you're scary, like, like real life scary. Which is why See, it's and good. I think that's what, yeah. yeah, I think that's why I was drawn to it more too, because this is the one that King allegedly says, I put it away for two years or three years or however long, like I didn't want to do it, but I needed to publish something. So eh, here's this don't really want to, but you know, and for it to freak King out more than anything else it's like okay like that, that makes it way better to me it's like yes you know so i'm also a chicken and i don't like horror so there's that too. this is this is one of the least horror of any of the books we've read so far this depends on how you define it it depends on how you define this it. is thriller this is psychological this none is none of these horror. have been scary let's be honest not a single scene in any of these have been scary in the least okay yeah. Yeah. Move along. Final thoughts. I don't have one other than I'm I'm good. This was scary and like like psychologically, you know, for my real life scary and that's it. I don't like that. Anyway, um, let's go in reverse order of how we did favorite things. So I think Luke, you're next. Uh final thought. Great book. I will definitely read this one again. I really, really liked the Poe style writing uh throughout. It I grew up reading Edgar Allan Poe's short stories that Melissa left her uh, paperback at my house when she moved out. So I, I have it back now. You have it back? Good, because I haven't seen it in a while. Uh, but it just, I, I like that style of writing. It speaks to me. It's the only thing, if you can get in someone's head and follow through the insanity that well, like that's good writing to me. That's that's one of the things that's hard to do. It's It can easily feel manufactured. I believed every bit of Lewis losing his mind because every single step he made was a thousand percent rational for the wrong reasons and i just loved it so much it was it was really really well done That's highly Benji. so my final thought with this whole story uh, i'll paraphrase a good paramedic buddy of mine he said dying sucks but death is only painful for the living and that this book emphasizes that it's you know yeah, the dying, it hurts and everything, but Gage is good. Norma's good. Let them just, you know, be. Dog. Sometimes dead is better. I mean, really? Right? Just exactly. asking. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, and this is, yeah, I would, I would put it, this is my, you know, my number one, uh, you know, just standalone. I, I think I like the talisman as a story. Uh, overall, maybe I don't know, boy, it's neck and neck with him. But he did a collab with with Peter Straub on that. So just uh, Stephen King by himself. This is my number one overall. I love it. So, but uh, again, I respect the folks that uh, can't get through it. I understand if you can't, uh, or or even uh, rereading it would definitely be uh, tough, especially if you're a parent. Uh, I, I would just think it, you know, definitely would be so. But yeah, it's, a, it's my it's my number one uh, Stephen King book. I have a question for you. Absolutely. So when we first decided to do like a month by month thing, I just picked books that were short-ish. Sorry to those of you who are picking up some of the summer readings. They're a little longer. But I picked some of the shorter ones, but I couldn't do everything. But then I started going through sort of his early works and the stuff that I hadn't read yet. And the one that I, I read it six months ago, and this book is still stuck with me. Have you read The Long Walk? I don't believe I have read that one. It's one of his Richard Bachman books. Okay. I think I have heard of that one. No. I try it. I, uh, I'm curious what, like, a hardcore Stephen King fan and somebody who, like, has had a long relationship with his books would feel about it. Because it's not, there's not that supernatural element but that continual progression of like you just have to do this it i i, I would be interested in knowing what you think and uh, uh another yeah the gunslinger series i, I read yeah. that so that's fun all right i really appreciate you being here thank you so much for joining us uh, pleasure is all mine folks so yeah great to be here
So th thanks for having me. Yeah, it was great to talk with folks that, uh, you know, love to talk about this kind of stuff. So I enjoyed it. When we were planning for all of the shows, we're, we're kind of trying to do maybe one guest every time. And Benji was like, dog wants pet cemetery. <laughs> he wants in. And so yeah. I've had people saying, hey, what about I'm like, okay, but that one's not available. We <laughs> have a person. And well, I hope I didn't right. you were wonderful. I'm so glad you were here yeah. for this. No, thank you, dog. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to plug, like uh, anything in your channel going on or anything like that? Uh, not not at the moment. You know, just kind of going day by day right now. So uh, just like everybody else. But uh, yeah, it was just great to be out and doing a live stream again, kind of like this and and getting to see the folks and stuff. Uh, I can see you folks in the chat, too. Um, <laughs> but, and uh, Yeah, it's great to see you folks out here. I'll try to get out a little more and uh, start doing some stuff. So, but yeah, thanks for having me, folks. It meant a lot. All right. I think that wraps it up, boys. Yep. So make sure you're following us on social media at Floats Down Here on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, send us a digital red balloon or with this one, uh, a Wendingo charm uh, at Floats Down Here at gmail.com. Uh, look us up at the podcast that.com where you can find all of our shows. Subscribe and rate us on iTunes and YouTube at Drawbridge Media on YouTube there. This show and all of our shows at the podcast.com are produced with the love and support of our wonderful Imaginary Legion patrons. You should go there to patreon.com slash stayimaginary to learn more about our awesome reward tiers. We want to give you things, and that would be cool. So I believe the boys are going to do a movie watch probably this weekend. Stay tuned for updates and check for notifications on that but that's typically what happens after that i'm speaking for you gentlemen this or the following we'll see we'll see which it's, weekend yeah. just I mean, check I social won't be there. i don't do scary movies but in june first monday of june right that's when we do these live streams first monday of june our next book is misery where we meet the popular author paul sheldon and his super fan annie wilkes Gee Wilkers, you'll float too. Stay imaginary. Thanks. The podcast that floats down here. <laughs>「Hi, I'm Melissa, your Stephen King veteran.」「Hi, I'm Ben, the Stephen King and horror film fanboy. » «And hello, I'm Luke, your first-time Stephen King reader. 